We live in a world that is uniquely designed to our specifications. Or at least, we have made it so. The places we live and the things we live with are all scaled to our particular dimensions, by and large. Which is not yet a pun. When we go to the store, the things we find there, whether they be chairs or food or reading material, are all sized to a proportion designed to accommodate us specifically. The houses we live in are more or less sized to us, the cars we drive accommodate our dimensions, and the clothes we wear generally fit reasonably well. For the average person, the world is their size. Though, in the middle of the 20th century, the Air Force learned something interesting about the average person. See, there was a problem in the United States Air Force. Pilots kept crashing and losing their planes, and often, their lives. In the 1940s, jet planes were just beginning to become a thing, but the pilots couldn't keep control of them. It didn't matter what plane it was, and granted they were complicated and much faster than the old prop jobs, but even so, planes were being lost with such regularity and frequency that no one could quite figure out what the problem was. At one point, the Air Force lost 17 different planes in one day due to what was increasingly being called pilot error. Except the pilots knew it wasn't their fault. Engineers checked the wreckages each time a plane went down and were unable to find anything mechanically or electrically wrong in most cases. Planes would duff a landing or unexpectedly dive out of the sky or simply wipe themselves out along the ground. But there wasn't anything specifically wrong with them to cause them to do so. It had to be the pilot's fault. Still, the pilots insisted their skills were not to blame. So if it wasn't the pilot's fault, and it wasn't a mechanical or electrical fault, what was costing the Air Force so many planes and so many men? Multiple inquiries and investigations failed to turn up an answer. In 1926, the Army Air Corps, which would later become the U.S. Air Force, designed their first ever standardized cockpit. To do so, the engineers responsible for the design took every conceivable measurement from hundreds of male pilots, there being not many female pilots at the time, for a variety of reasons. With the data collected, they designed a standardized set of dimensions for the cockpit. Everything from the size and shape of the seat, to the distance to the pedals and stick, to the shape of the flight helmet, was standardized to fit the average dimensions of a pilot. From 1926. Which, someone began to think, might not still apply to the pilots of the 40s. Maybe the problem was pilots didn't fit the cockpits anymore. So in 1950, the Air Force set out to remeasure the current batch of pilots and, if needed, redesign everything so as to eliminate the mysterious causes of plane and pilot failure. At Wright Air Force Base in Ohio, researchers and scientists measured over 4,000 pilots on 140 different dimensions. Thumb length, distance between the eyes, length of nose, inseam length, and even the distance from the tip of the nose to the ear on each side were taken. And then an average for each of the measurements was calculated. By knowing what an average pilot was, the Air Force and its engineers could design a better standardized cockpit and flight suit and eliminate one source of the crashes almost entirely. Everyone involved agreed this was the way to go and would solve the problem entirely. Everyone except newly hired 23-year-old Lieutenant Gilbert S. Daniels, a physical anthropology major from Harvard who had thoroughly examined and measured human anatomy as part of his coursework. And what he had learned by taking measurements of the hands of 250 undergraduates who all came from similar socioeconomic backgrounds as part of his undergraduate thesis was that no two hands were the same, even among those who the science at the time said should have been and he had grave misgivings about the Air Force study he had just become a part of. Namely, that there was no such thing as average. 
Sure, mathematically, you could arrive at a series of average measurements for all the parts the Air Force was measuring, but practically, at a man-to-man -man level, there was no such thing as the average pilot. Daniels took ten of the most important measurements, height, chest circumference, sleeve length, and waist measurement, for instance, and calculated the averages. He then gave a margin of error of 30% across all the gathered data from all 4,000 plus pilots and went looking for the average pilot. So if the average height was 5 foot 9, anyone from 5 foot 7 to 5 11 would qualify as meeting the average height by his definition. Naturally, everyone thought that the vast majority of pilots would fit into the range and told him so. That was the whole point of having the averages, wasn't it? Most pilots would fit cockpits and flight suits designed to the new averages, and the problems of pilots not fitting the equipment would be at an end. Especially since the Air Force was already pre-selecting pilots on characteristics like their height to bring them in range of the perceived average. No one over about six foot tall, for example, was selected as a pilot. They already wouldn't fit the suits and cockpits, so they were out. So obviously, the vast majority of pilots would fit the averages by virtue of pre-screening. After going through all 4,063 pilots, Daniels reached his conclusion. Of the 10 measurements on his list with their 30% margin for each measurement, exactly zero pilots met all 10. There is no such thing as the average pilot. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. So what then makes a giant a giant? We all think we know what giants are, and keep in mind we're not yet talking about giant animals in general, but rather giant humanoids. Clearly, giants are human-like creatures of great size, much taller than your average per- Oh, you see the problem. To someone five feet tall, a giant might well be anyone over six or seven feet tall, which would make entire basketball teams, which are on average about six feet six inches tall, a collection of giants compared to the five-foot standard. In the 2019-2020 NBA season, there were 13 American players over seven feet tall. Are giants, in fact, taking over our basketball teams to the exclusion of normal-sized players? Who knows? Who even cares? We don't do sports here. But that's the thing. Within basketball, the six-foot or taller player is normal, average, you wouldn't really think twice about going onto a basketball court and finding someone at least six foot tall. It's expected there. It doesn't make them giants, it just makes them basketball players. Which is not to say all people over six feet tall are basketball players. We're six foot four, and we can't stand the game. So there. So if being taller than normal or average as a particular criterion for identifying giants is out, what other factors can we examine? And yes, we know we're overlooking the obvious intensifier here, but bear with us. Well, part of the definition of giant includes strength as one of the defining characteristics. Great strength, once again, plays against our perceptions of normal and average. What counts as great strength compared to the average person? Is a 50-pound weight normal? You always see it on employment descriptions, must be able to occasionally lift 50 pounds, so that seems a good place to start. But when you consider that at least one record holder, 39-year-old Brian Shaw, is able to lift over 1,000 pounds on a regular basis and stands at 6 foot 8 inches tall, that may make him the world's smallest giant. There are a number of people taller than he, but few stronger. Six foot eight seems pretty gigantic in the five foot world. But to us, it's just someone a bit taller than ourselves. Hold on to that thought. All of this is just by way of pointing out that the definition of giant, a legendary human-like being of great stature and strength, 
is largely a useless definition of a giant if you've never seen one before. The only important word in the definition is the word legendary. But we all know what a giant is when we see one, don't we? They tower over us and are built of mostly muscle. You look up and then just keep looking up until you fall over. They eat whole cows in one bite and tear up trees by their roots. They play football with boulders and terrorize mountain passes doing it. They're dangerous and often vile creatures that threaten all civilized people. Half cannibal, half evil, and half tormentor of princesses and heroes in your basic Grimm's fairy tale. Of course, if you've played Dungeons and Dragons, chances are you probably know giants fairly well. Or at least you think you do. Most recently, in the fifth edition of the game, you might have picked up the official adventure Storm King's Thunder, itself a sort of re-envisioning and sometimes retread of the earlier edition series of adventures called Against the Giants. Both adventures take characters up against the nearly complete collection of D&D giants. From the slovenly, dim-witted hill giants at a mere 16 feet tall, to the fashionista 24 foot tall cloud giants, to the towering storm giants and their floating homes. And they all run the range from intelligent to stupid, clean to grimy, good to evil, and chaotic to lawful. And the reason they are so varied in Dungeons and Dragons, and why they didn't all fall from beanstalks, which, by the way, would probably have made the one in that story a cloud giant who really should have been much smarter, is that, as usual, Gygax and the gang drew from all sorts of different sources to come up with their giants. But mostly, it has to be said, they came from Norse mythology. In particular, the frost, fire, and mountain giants come from the Jotun of Norse mythology. And we all know all about that thanks to Marvel movies, we're sure. The Jotun were a race of giants set in opposition to the Norse gods who were constantly trying to bring about Ragnarok and end the world. Except, well, except that wasn't true of all Jotunar, which is the plural of the word Jotun. Jotun singular, Jotunar plural. The Jotunar came from the body of Ymir, the being from before the world really existed. In Immer's death, the Jotnar sailed away on the sea of Immer's blood and came to rest again once Immer's body had been used to form the world. But not all the Jotnar were giants. In fact, the Jotnar seemed to have been a diverse group of individuals without any direct relation to one another other than all breaking free from Immer when the time came. Some of them are giants, to be sure, but just as many are described as human in shape and size. Some are beautiful and some are grotesque, and some of the deities they oppose are even given as descendants of the Jotnar, notably Thor and Odin. It's a real mixed bag that feels more like a class of beings than a race. Oh, also, the word Aten is used to mean more or less the same thing as Jotun. So make of that what you will. Fortunately, many other traditions have giants as well. It's a pretty easy idea to come up with. What if we imagined people like us, but bigger, seems to be about all it takes. But the end results can sometimes be entertaining. Some giants get credited with creating bits of the landscape, or in some cases entire countries. According to Baltic mythology, the piece of land known as the Curonian Spit was created by the play of a giantess child along the shore. Some Native American traditions credit the misbehavior of giants with creating deserts in the American Southwest. And across many locations in Europe, giants get the credit for creating mountain ranges and scattering stones across otherwise flat landscapes. Perhaps the most famous landscape feature credited to a giant is the Giant's Causeway, located in County Antrim on the north coast of Northern Ireland, and declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. 50 to 60 million years ago, the causeway was an area of intense volcanic activity. Molten basalt moved through the area underneath and through a layer of natural chalk beds, forming an extensive volcanic plateau. When the lava cooled, it shrank and separated from the chalk, allowing the chalk to wear away while also fracturing the basalt layer into columns, giving the area its distinctive Minecraft-like appearance. The legend, of course, is far more entertaining, if somewhat less accurate scientifically. 
As the name suggests, the Giant's Causeway was purpose-built by a giant. Irish giant Finn McCool was challenged to a fight by the Scottish giant Benendonner. Upon accepting the challenge, McCool created the causeway so the two of them would have a place to fight. But then got the wobblies when he realized just how big Brennan Donner was. So much bigger is the Scottish giant that when McCool gets his wife to hide him dressed up as a baby, Brennan Donner has no trouble believing Finn is a baby and figures the father must be humongous and far bigger than he which in turn gives Brennan Donner the Wobblies, and he hightails it back to where he came from, abandoning the fight and wrecking the causeway behind him so McCool can't follow. The story is lent credence by the fact that on the Scottish island of Staffa, an identical set of basalt columns exists from the same lava flow that created the Irish ones. The Basque people on the border of France and Spain have an interesting giant tradition, at least what we know of Basque mythology does. The problem is, not much of it survives past the arrival of Christianity in the region, and much of what is known is pieced together from fragmentary sources. Still, most of the Basque giants were generally helpful if somewhat rough living. Located among the hills and mountains of the Basque, one group of giants, called the Gentilac, which meant Gentile, lived among and alongside the Basque building megalithic structures. Said to be so tall they could walk in the sea, the Gentile would throw stones from mountain top to mountain top and inspired the Basque game Pilota, which is a bit like hand or racquetball. And just for good measure, these giants taught metallurgy to the Basque people. When the star appeared heralding the Christ child, the Gentilac went underground, never to be seen or heard from again, except for one of their number, Olenzero who appears every Christmas. One explanation holds that the Gentilac represent the Basque people who decided not to convert to Christianity and instead went into the forest to maintain the old customs and ways of life on their own. And of course, once you get to Christianity, there's one main giant everyone knows. Goliath. To briefly review, the Israelite army under King Saul, is encamped atop a hill. On the opposite side of the valley in front of them, also encamped atop a hill, is the Philistine army. Each side is preparing for a very difficult battle, especially since whichever side starts first is going to have to battle uphill at a disadvantage to reach the other army and suffer significant losses and bloodshed. Rather than do this, the Philistines hit on the idea of single combat. Each side would choose a champion and send them out into the valley to do battle one-on-one. -on -one. Whichever champion won the battle would see their side declared the victor without all the nasty killing that is sure to follow for both armies if the more traditional battle is engaged. It's not a bad idea, really. It's just that none of the Israelites want any part of it, because the Philistine champion is Goliath, a giant clothed in 125 pounds of bronze armor from head to toe and wielding three weapons, a bronze javelin, a sword, and a spear so massive that it looks like a supporting timber to a house. And every day, Goliath is led out to the front of the Philistine army and into the valley, accompanied by a shield-bearer carrying a full-body shield to challenge the Israelites to produce a champion. For 40 days and 40 nights, this goes on, and no one accepts. Until one day, a shepherd boy from Bethlehem shows up to bring food to his three older brothers serving in the army, and hears Goliath issue his challenge. Hearing that the man who accepts the challenge will win honors and freedom for his family, the boy, David, goes to King Saul and offers to take on the giant himself. Saul at first refuses, pointing out that David is just a boy, and that Goliath has been fighting since before David was born. David assures Saul of his qualifications fighting lions and bears while protecting the flocks of his father, and Saul relents, giving David his own armor and sword. 
But since David has not used these things before, he rejects them and instead grabs smooth stones from a nearby riverbed. With these and his shepherd's staff, David sets out to meet Goliath. And perhaps you know the rest. How Goliath mocks David and threatens to leave his body for the animals to dispose of. And how David responds in kind and informs Goliath and all the Philistines that God is on his side and there's no way he can lose. And then you'll know that David swung his little sling and hit Goliath between the eyes with a rock and killed him. And how this was proof that the little guy can triumph over the big guy, even in the face of overwhelming odds, as long as God is on his side. Except that wasn't the point of the story. And the odds probably weren't overwhelming. And anyone who had any experience fighting in that day and age knew, almost immediately, just how much trouble Goliath was in when David answered the challenge and picked up the rocks. First things first, the point of the story of David and Goliath is not that little things can beat big things. That's the wrong takeaway. The point was... King Saul was unfit to rule the Israelites, as shown by his refusal to answer the challenge for 40 days and nights. And you might think, yeah, but he would be trying to fight a fully armed and armored giant. Who wouldn't be afraid? Well, how about a king that was over six feet tall himself? And before you go on about Goliath being a giant... It's important to realize that most texts refer to Goliath as being four cubits and a span tall, which works out to just over six foot nine inches, much like our strong man from before. As for the armor, if you read the account again, you'll see that Saul owned a set of armor at least as good as Goliath's. It is, after all, the set of armor that David rejects. So the point being made was that Saul was a coward and thereby demonstrated to be unfit to rule, while David was shown to be God's next choice. The lessons we take from the story today have changed quite a bit. David tells Saul, in asking for the chance to go against Goliath, that he used to watch his father's flock, and if a lion or bear came and took a lamb, he would go after it and attack it. One version renders it as, knock the lion down, Another says he struck it and recovered the lamb. If the predator got up again or fought back and attacked him, David would then kill it. And the thing is, the language is there to tell you exactly what is going on. David, the shepherd, would use his sling to either knock the lion or bear down and get the sheep back or outright kill it in the first place. Anything that survived and tried to fight back, dazed as it was, had its throat cut. In other words, David, like every other person of the day who was good with a sling, was very, very good with his sling and very practiced with it. Which any fighting man in any army of the day would have known was bad news. That made David one of the most potent ranged combatants of the day. Absolutely deadly. And if like we always had, you assumed rocks used as sling ammo were small little things? They weren't. They weighed about nine ounces or so, and were about the size of a tennis ball. No wonder David was knocking bears down. The writer, Malcolm Gladwell, shares some interesting research that has occurred over the years regarding Goliath in his book, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. According to his findings, Goliath probably wasn't all we'd cracked him up to be. We've already discussed the height disparity, but there are other factors weighing against Goliath from the get-go. We won't go into all of them, because you certainly should read the book for yourself. But a few of the high points include, Goliath was all geared up for single, man-to-man, -man close combat, which David had no intention of giving him. His maneuverability was very low, and he had no real defense planned against ranged combat of the kind David was going to offer. Goliath was also probably very unwell. Based on details given in the biblical accounts about the way Goliath acts and moves and the way he says the things he says, 
It's probable that Goliath suffered from a benign tumor on his pituitary gland, which would account for a number of things, including his increased height thanks to overproduction of human growth hormone in a condition called acromegaly. The same condition suffered by Guinness World Record holder for tallest ever person at 8 foot 11 inches, Robert Wadlow. One of the side effects of acromegaly is poor vision as the tumor presses on the optic nerves, resulting in double vision and restricted sight. Which would explain why Goliath needed a shield bearer for a fight he expected to be man-to-man -man melee combat. He wasn't a shield bearer. He was leading a Goliath who couldn't see at all well out to the battlefield. Which also explains why, upon seeing a boy dressed as a shepherd charging across the valley at him, carrying a shepherd's staff and twirling a sling above his head, something which a fighting man of Goliath's long experience should have recognized as serious trouble, he didn't duck behind the big shield in front of him. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, why not head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and explore the options for supporting the show that you can find on our support page. Through the generous support of our patrons and fans, the show remains commercial-free and freely available to you to listen to whenever you want. So thanks to them, and thanks to you too, if you decide to help out. David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants by Malcolm Gladwell is available on Amazon, naturally. We'll link to it in the description of the show. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who at 6'4 is not, in fact, a giant of any sort. Just a very tall dwarf. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Remember that when you think you are seeing giants, they may not be giants at all. Perhaps it is you who is the dwarf.